High-speed trains are fast, efficient, and low carbon. They can be found all over the world in growing numbers. But who takes the cake for the world's best high-speed rail system? China. In little more than a decade, China has built almost 40,000 kilometers of high-speed rail, connecting nearly every major city in the country. China now counts for roughly two-thirds of the world's high-speed rail volume, outstripping both Japan and the EU. Meanwhile, in Europe, only 11,000 kilometers of high-speed rail are currently in use, according to the World Wide Railway Organization. And forget about the US, it barely even has one. So how did China do it? Can other countries even come close to achieving the same? And what do expensive lizards have to do with it? In this video, we'll show you why China is the best at building high-speed railways. To give you an idea of just how impressive this feat is, we have to dial history back a bit. In 1969, Japan was the first country to debut a high-speed train. The UIC defines high speed as faster than 200 km per hour. Back then, the Shinkansen bullet train could run at 210. Eager to compete, the US inaugurated its Metro Liner service between New York and Washington, D.C. in 1969. Next up, France. In 1981, it opened a high-speed train line between Paris and Lyon. Then Germany got on board with the Intercity Express in 91. Italy, Spain, and Russia soon began rolling out their own networks. In contrast, China's rail network had changed little over the decades and was in no shape for high-speed use. But then, China's so-called economic miracle did its thing. The Chinese did not invent high-speed rail, but boy had they adopted the idea and run with it. They are now streaks ahead of any other high-speed operator in terms of the network they built. It's incredibly well organized. Everyone on the high-speed network has its own reserve seat. They've got all the boarding processes down. Today, you can get from Beijing to Shanghai, a distance of 1,300 kilometers, in just four hours. You can go from north to south, from Beijing to Guangzhou, in eight hours, instead of the 22 on a regular train. And if you really wanted to, you could take a bullet train to Tibet, at 3,000 meters above sea level, with automated oxygen supply and tinted windows, so you don't get sunburn at such a high altitude. So how is this all even possible? Well, firstly, because they do it for a bargain price. In China, a kilometer of high-speed track costs 17 to 21 million USD. In Europe, the price tag is 25 to 39 million US dollars. China's infrastructure boom was and is a matter of political will, but also the ability to mobilize massive amounts of cheap labor, which is connected to cheap materials. They take a massive amount of steel and aluminum and other really carbon-intensive materials, which are sourced from domestic partners. And using domestic partners, of course, boosts the economy. By the 2008 Beijing Olympics, China had already opened its first high-speed line from Beijing to Tianjin that ran at 350 km per hour. They started with the 4x4 network, so 4 north to south and 4 east to west, and that was around 2004. Then to deal with the financial crisis in the late 2000s, the idea was that they would extend parts of the 4x4 network, and then afterwards, around the mid-2010s, they were like, wait, this isn't going to be enough. We need to double the whole network. It's going to be 8x8, not 4x4. Except to do that, you would also have to move a lot of people out of the way. China has been swift and ruthless about relocating residents. And if you don't want to move, well, they'll just build around you until you do. But it's not just people you have to move. Germany's Stuttgart rail station, for example, has been planned since 1995, but it is nowhere near done. It faced endless budget and planning problems, including lizards. In 2017, the delayed project was further derailed when Deutsche Bahn claimed it would have to resettle endangered lizards at a cost of 15 million euros. That's a budget of 2 to 4 thousand euros per lizard. Not in China. The Chinese legal code allows the authorities to basically do what is necessary for the nation over its people and animals. So China doesn't have that issue of moving people because they can exercise eminent domain and kick people out of their fields. By 2013, China had built 10,000 kilometers of high-speed rail just about the total amount currently in use in the whole of Europe. And it doesn't have to worry about profitability. Many lines are running at huge operating losses. Why? Politics, of course. The numbers speak for themselves. It is not economically viable in the near term or even the medium term. There's going to be something else going on. Thinking of those hinterlands of China, like Xinjiang and Tibet, was more part of a Belt and Road Initiative type of program with clear geopolitical goals alongside economic ones. China's high-speed story has been so successful that trains could actually dominate commercial travel, which bodes pretty well for the country's goal to be carbon neutral by 2060. But there's another factor in its favor. Flying in China sucks. Its airports are constantly ranked the worst in the world for punctuality. You can thank the military for that. It controls roughly three-quarters of China's airspace. 
So that means commercial flights have to wait until the army gives the go-ahead for takeoff. And guess who that's good for? The rails have basically outcompeted the airline companies. For example, between eastern China to central China. These were routes which were very big with the airlines. Before high speed came in, the railways have been able to attract so many more customers that flights have pretty much ceased between these metropolitan pairs. Building all of this is carbon intensive, but all in all, China's push for rail still greatly reduces its long-term footprint. And for the world's biggest CO2 emitter, that's a big payoff for the planet. But China's story is nowhere near the end. The country is aiming to double its high-speed network by 2035, taking it to 70,000 kilometers of tracks. And if that weren't enough, the government recently made a big splash around the rollout of its fastest maglev train. You heard that right, magnetic levitation, which goes up to 600 kilometers per hour. It's the world's fastest land vehicle. One of the major factors contributed to China's success in building a vast high-speed railway network is its skilled workforce and expertise in the field. With the combination of dedicated professionals, a strong education system, and continuous investment in research and development, China has established itself as a global leader in HSR technology and construction. To begin with, China's education system plays a critical role in supplying the industry with well-trained professionals. The country has a large number of universities and technical institutions that offer specialized programs in railway engineering, transportation management, and related disciplines. These programs, often in collaboration with international partners, ensure a steady pipeline of skilled engineers, planners, and managers who are well-versed in the latest HSR technologies and the best practices. Additionally, China has established dedicated research centers and institutions, such as the China Academy of Railway Sciences, to foster innovation and knowledge exchange within the sector. Furthermore, China has invested heavily in developing its domestic expertise by sending professionals abroad for training and collaboration with international experts. In the initial stages of HSR development, Chinese engineers and technicians worked closely with their counterparts from countries like Japan, Germany, and France to learn from their experience and adopt advanced technologies. This process of technology transfer and adaption has played a vital role in accelerating China's progress in the HSR sector. Another significant aspect of China's skilled workforce is its sheer size, which enables the rapid construction of HSR projects. With a large labor force at its disposal, China can allocate resources efficiently and carry out massive infrastructure projects within relatively short timeframes. The country has also developed a robust construction industry with companies like China Railway Construction Corporation, or CRCC, and China State Construction Engineering Corporation, or CSCEC, emerging as global players in HSR construction and project management. In addition to technical expertise, China's HSR workforce is also known for its strong work ethic and commitment to project completion. Employees in the sector often work long hours and are willing to relocate to project sites, ensuring that deadlines are met and construction proceeds without delay. Through technology transfers, knowledge exchange, and joint ventures, China has harnessed the expertise of resources of other countries to accelerate its HSR development and establish itself as a global leader in the field. In the early stages of China's HSR journey, the country sought partnerships with countries possessing advanced HSR technology, such as Japan, Germany, and France. These collaborations provided China with access to cutting-edge technologies, design principles, and construction techniques, which were then adapted and integrated into its domestic HSR system. Chinese engineers and technicians worked closely with their international counterparts to learn best practices, gain hands-on experience, and acquire the necessary skills to build a world-class HSR network. International collaboration has also been instrumental in the transfer of advanced train manufacturing technology by forming joint ventures with leading train manufacturers such as Siemens, Alstom, and Kawasaki, China has developed its own domestic train production capabilities. These partnerships have facilitated the transfer of know-how in train design, propulsion systems, and safety features, allowing China to manufacture high-performance trains that rival those of established HSR networks in other countries. Another critical aspect of Chinese collaboration with international partners is the sharing of knowledge and expertise in HSR management and operations. Through partnerships with experienced HSR operators like France's SNCF and Germany's Deutsche Bahn, China has gained valuable insights into efficient HSR operation and maintenance, as well as customer service and safety standards. These lessons have been applied to China's HSR system, contributing to its reputation for reliability and punctuality. Beyond technology transfers and knowledge exchange, China has also embarked on joint HSR projects with other countries, both as an investor and as a supplier of technology and expertise. 
China's HSR companies have been involved in the planning, construction, and operation of high-speed rail lines in countries such as Indonesia, Thailand, and Turkey. These international projects showcase China's HSR capabilities on the global stage and allow for further opportunities for collaboration and innovation. So, can other countries do the same? Well, no. In Europe, you can blame the plane. Flights are just too cheap. Why take a 40-hour train when I can get from Berlin to Edinburgh in two hours for, are you ready for it? 10 euros. European air travel has actually been on the rise in the past few years. The pandemic devastated all travel, but the rail system took such a hard hit that the EU launched a campaign to lure travelers back. But the bloc's bigger problem is a pretty obvious one. There are 27 countries in it. The biggest issue in Europe is the fragmentation. Different operators with blinkers on, looking at their own bit and not seeing the big picture. Europe has its own rail agency, but it has no legal power to regulate projects or enforce deadlines. This makes cross-border coordination of schedules and fares kind of a mess. Say you want to go from Madrid to Rome by high-speed rail. You need four different ones to get there. Barcelona, Paris, Turin, then Rome. The whole trip will take you over 49 hours, and you'll have to book each leg separately from different providers. Shanghai to Chengdu is roughly the same distance as Madrid to Rome, which runs on a single high-speed trail line and takes 11 hours. And what about India, a country comparable in size and population? It has a vast rail network, but not one high-speed line yet. The first planned one linking Mumbai to Ahmedabad has been delayed for five years over land acquisition issues. And the US? The US had a fantastic network of trains, some of the best trains in the world. They had streamlined trains with Vista domes, diners, lounges, observation lounges when they were running wooden cages with steam trains in the late 30s. But when the 60s came, America became the land of the automobile, and they pretty much threw it all away. They got a skeleton network now with Amtrak. Despite government pledges for the largest investment in rail since the creation of Amtrak, car-loving taxpayers haven't provided the political drive to move the needle anytime soon. In the US, more than any sort of policy paradigm, it's just the fundamental car culture that has been here since they invented cars. So it doesn't look like anyone will catch up to China soon. But the country has shown one way a high-speed rail future could be realized. So how's the high-speed rail in your country? Tell us in the comments below and make sure to subscribe!